So, <laughs> morning, King's Arms Church. Welcome to our uh, 9.30 every Sunday morning live stream. Sorry about the fact you're, you're seeing me press buttons and click the screen as we start. Uh, we had a, we were a bit late getting live this morning because we had a couple of technical problems, so I've reverted to an older camera. But that's not going to stop us doing anything different this morning. Uh, what it did mean is that as we were fussy with technology, we didn't get to pray, which uh, James, Lucy and I do spend time praying before the service. And uh, if anybody else is with us, we pray with them too. But let's do that now then, shall we? As we gather together uh, and pray. Father, just settle our hearts, settle our minds, settle our spirits now before you. Bring us uh, humbly, but with bold expectation before your word to worship, Lord. Father, every week we pray for all the fellowships in this town, all those that love the name of Jesus, all those that are guided by the Holy Spirit, who honour you as the way, the truth and the life, Lord. We pray that you would bless their service time this morning and that there would be an anointing on your people as they gather to worship you and hear your word. So, Father, we join with the communion of saints now to worship your name and to bring glory to you. Amen. Amen. A warm welcome to all our regulars. It's, it's really good to know there are a, a good core group of you that, that come in every single week. I just feel particularly I want to say good morning to you, Rita, this morning, because I know you're still isolating and Joe as well. And I'm sure there's others, but just be blessed this morning as, as you as you uh, listen to the words this morning and join in with the worship. Should also say a very special uh, welcome to Miguel. It's his 18th birthday today. I don't know if he's even up and about and watching it or whether we'll watch it later online. But uh, given that Lola posted that at half past two this morning, she's probably still in bed too. So we need to pray for her to get some sleep <laughs> and some rest. But a very uh, be blessed, Miguel, as you as you turn 18 and as you journey in your new job and your new work, we just pray a blessing on you and your family. So welcome to you and all your family. And I should say also good morning to Dave and Lynn watching from down in Cornwall. They've gone off for a week in their caravan. And isn't that just one of the uh, wonders or the one of the benefits of online service that even though they're, they're away from the town, that I know their intent is still to join in and, and worship with us this morning. So Dave, I hope you've put the seats out in the caravan properly and in a proper order. And Lynn, you're not sat at the back. Come on into the service and join worship this morning with us. And of course, we've got people from further afield. We've got people in Colombia that listen and we've got people in Australia. And all of those you around the forest and Lydney, a warm welcome to you. In case you didn't see it, because I know not everybody is on our WhatsApp group, we are doing communion at the end of this morning's service. So if you want to stay with us and, and share in communion, which we'll do after the word and after a, a closing song, uh, get yourself some bread, get yourself some wine and, and be ready. And we will share communion at the end of the service. So you've got time to get that ready now before the end. Um, also, a couple of quick notices is that this Tuesday coming is the first Tuesday in July. So we will have our church prayer meeting. I will send out a Zoom uh, invitation to that via our email list, via our WhatsApp group. Um, it's also possible, I know we're allowed to meet in small groups now, so maybe a couple of you might like to, to gather together at someone's home. I think the weather forecast is good, so perhaps you could do that even in the garden. So we might be able to do it with less sessions on Zoom, but more people joining together to, people's houses and kind of do a, a combo of online and together so let's have a think about that and perhaps you can invite someone to your house to be part of the prayer meeting and have an evening with them that'd be a good social thing to do wouldn't it um and then also i have phoned this is for the men uh, there's adventure golf which is just up in little dean they are open they're taking groups of six but you can have several groups of six so i'm planning to organize a men's uh, get together and a men's gathering and we're going to go and play adventure golf and get the men back and meeting together and ladies perhaps you can have a think about something you can do and I know Bob's house group will be meeting Tuesday online but we can start thinking about how we can form smaller groups at least even if we're staying online 
on a Sunday for the, for the next few weeks at least anyway. So that's a lot of notices, that's a lot of talk. I want to get into the word of God, I want to read a psalm to you, and then we're going to go into worship. We've got three songs to worship to. Uh, but let's start by reading Psalm 46, which fits in with our first song, which is Be Still, for the presence of the Lord is here. I'm going to read the whole psalm. It reminds us that God is our refuge and strength. He is our ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, so there's a follow on to that, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth may give way and the mountains fall to the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is still a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help at break of day. Nations may be in uproar, kingdoms can fall, but he lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolation that he has brought on the earth, but he will make war cease to the ends of the earth, he breaks the bow, he shatters the spear, he burns the shields with fire. Indeed, he is Lord. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Church, king's arms, all people of God. Can I just read this last verse to you? The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come on, Lord, in you we put our trust. We come before you now. We say we'll be still before you because the presence of the Lord is here. The Holy One is here. Let's bow before him in reverence and even with a holy fear that says this earth may quake and crumble, but you are steadfast and you are true. So let's sing that now. And then we're going to be singing, come now is the time to worship and cornerstone in you alone I put my trust. So we've got these three songs. Let's just see where the Lord leads us in worship now. Amen.
Sorry, just have to, due to those technical problems, it's a bit more fiddly for me this morning, but let's not let that bother us, let's not let that worry us at all. Let's just follow on from that Christ alone cornerstone, uh, lead us into prayer. Let's take a moment now just to bow before our Lord. I want you, as you're, you're in your homes or your caravans or wherever you are, to just uh, bear yourself before the Lord now. You may just remain seated, you may stand, you may want to kneel, but I want you to do something that just recognises you are humbly before the Lord now. Now, every uh, word for worship that's used in scripture has a physical action related to it. It's maybe reaching out your hand or clapping or even lying uh, completely flat on the floor. We're going to pray for a few minutes now. We want to recognise that this isn't just a, a, a fill-in time. This is a really powerful time to see God move. So, Father, we want to pray first of all and thank you that your kingdom is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, the time has come. The blessing of God is upon us. His kingdom is, is there for those who will reach out and take it. You are indeed Lord of all. And we bring our prayers before you in recognition that indeed you are Father God, you are King of Kings, you are Lord of Lords. And in that blessing, Lord, I want to pray again for Miguel on his 18th birthday, Lord, that you would uh, grow in him, your spirit would work within him and, and he would grow as our other youth will into true, uh, strong characters for God, men and women that have a godly life and a godly centre around their calling, Lord, and everything they do, uh, as we spoke on holiness and making decisions before God, Lord, that they would make their decisions before you and you would bless them as they walk in the light of your love, Lord, and the light of your sacrifice. Bless them now, Lord, and especially we pray for Miguel this morning on his birthday. And we pray a blessing, Lord, just take a moment now for anyone else you can think of, you want to pray a special blessing upon, um, in the strength and the name of Jesus. I want to bring several names before you, first of all, uh, and show me that Sandy has posted this morning that Yana, having been shielding and isolating for so long, is going out for her first walk today with her husband, Steve. Just pray that would bring her a real blessing, a real sense of refreshing, Lord, and, and a new chapter in her life, and indeed in her marriage, and just a, a good, good time for her, Lord, as, as she is strengthened by today and by that fresh air and by you. So we pray for Yana, we pray for Steve. Father, we pray for Rachel. Rachel has been to hospital this week. She's had problems with her ears, uh, being blocked and causing dizziness and sickness. 
and she's had trouble getting treatment for that, Lord, but we ask for your treatment and your work upon her and, and strength for Yeroon and the rest of the girls there in that family, Lord, uh, that they would uh, be around Rachel and they'd see healing for her. And I'd also pray for Kathy. Um, as uh, her ex-husband, Lord, has, has died this week, the father of her three girls, and, and the distress that's brought to them. And, the, and Father, we just pray your blessing upon them as a family now. And you'd be in any of the situations that are around that and any uh, organisation that needs to be doing, Lord, and you'd bring a, a sense of your love and compassion to each one of them, that you are around about them. Especially for Kathy, Lord, we pray that she would be able to minister to her daughters at this time. Thank you, Lord. I'll be quiet for a minute or so and just allow you to bring your own prayers now. Hallelujah. Father, we just ask you take these prayers, you bundle them now, you hear every word, you know every thought, you bring peace to the hearts that need peace, Lord, you bring courage to the hearts that need courage, you bring compassion, Lord, to those that are, are hard to you, but Father God, we just pray your blessing on each and every one now, in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen, Amen. Well, I've got a special Bible reader this morning for us. <laughs> Sam's going to come in and bring the word this morning, and then we're going to get into the word of God. Morning, everybody. Put the glasses on so I can see. 
Uh, I was talking with um, with Sandy this week about um, the mother of Jesus, and it's really hard being a mother. <laughs> and then you think about Mary and how hard that must have been. And uh, she must have been a really special person, um, and she must have gone through so much. But also, what a joy! So, you know, like there's mixed blessings, really, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm saying that because I'm reading today from uh, John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, um, about a wedding. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Anne. Probably don't want to stand in that corner all the time. No. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Thank you for that, Ad. Thank you. Great reading. That is a brilliant reading. It's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's an intriguing reading, isn't it? I, I, I preached on it once before, I recall, um, and that wasn't actually in church. It was actually in somebody's house up on the Roman Park estate. Um, it was some friends of ours. Uh, they they'd had a baby and uh, the mother very much wanted the, the child dedicated. The father wasn't prepared to come to church, but was prepared to have an event at their house. And so I went and we had a, a blessing in the house and, and I did a, a dedication and just blessed, asked God's blessing on them as parents and the baby. And, and I read that, that passage about the wedding in Cana because it's just such a, you know, everybody can relate to a wedding, can't they? It, it, it's, a, it's a regular event, it's a, it's a high point of life, it's a significant moment, as indeed is the dedication or, or bringing a child before God and the birth of a baby. So, you know, it had a connection. And, and that day, I just spoke on the abundance of, of the blessing that Jesus brought in that circumstance. And I, I tried to speak to them that that is God's heart, that he wants to bring a blessing to you in your circumstance. And I'm pleased to say, you know, it, it, I had quite a few questions of a positive nature of people wanting to inquire more about the Lord and him. And I just pray seeds were sown from that, that opportunity to go and just speak the gospel that God is a loving God, he's a, he's a blessing God, he's a God that wants to draw us into his presence by his love. But as you read, that story and indeed this happened this today this morning when Anne was just reading it through before the service she started to say what's this third day then what's what what, what are these stone jars what what are the cleansing jars what you know look at the way Mary was with with Jesus look at the way Jesus spoke you know it's a story that you can read on I don't want to say superficial, but perhaps you can. You can read as a superficial. Here's a wedding and here's Jesus turning water to wine. And it can just trip off the tongue very easily. And it is a nice story to get and easy to get into. But there's such a depth to it as well. And, and it's in scripture. 
and and I just felt as I was preparing this week, you know, I, I was I was thinking about Lord, what do you want me to say? And you know, we've just come off the back. We've had Tim Ayres and Martin Gibbs preach the last two weeks. I've had a couple of weeks break, and and I want to thank them now for their words they brought on Father and on unity in the church. Thank you to both of you for the words you brought. They were good. They were significant words. And I'd finished before that the four weeks previously speaking on holiness. And that was something that was really, it was one of those moments where God had said, you know, I really want you to speak to this and I had a real passion for speaking that word. And, and I'd like to encourage you, if, if you've already forgotten it, to go back and listen to them. Again, that's one of the beauties of these services. They're now all on Facebook, our Facebook page, and they're all on our YouTube channel so you can go back and listen and re-listen to those easily but when you've done a series that you've had a real sense of God's in this and you come to an end of it and you think well what am I going to preach now and you're sort of fishing around for there's lots of things you can preach on lots of topics and lots of directions you can go and and I was just hunting around saying Lord what what do you want to say to us and I don't know how or why, but he put this story back in my mind again of his desire to bless us. And as I looked at it, I just saw so many layers to it. And I just feel there's various elements to this. You know, there's so many elements to this story. I can't really bring them all to you today in one go. But we're going we're gonna to go through this and look at various things this, this, this story picks up. Let's remember, it's not a parable. It's not an analogy. It's a real live event. This really happened at a real point in time in history. In fact, it was one of the, it was the first recorded miracle that Jesus did. And in fact, we need, need to look at that and say, because this is only recorded in John's gospel. The other three synoptic gospels, as they're called, Matthew, Mark and Luke, don't record this event. So that John saw something special in it and John recorded it. Do you know, uh, John's gospel is very different to the three synoptic gospels. John has a very specific purpose for writing his gospel. Matthew, Mark and Luke had written their accounts in a sort of diarised fashion that Jesus did this. He went there, he did that and, and laid out uh, his, his genealogy and, and, and various aspects of his life. And, and, and like give a synopsis, that's why they're called synoptic gospels. But John's gospel is very different. John was known as the beloved disciple. John if you can say this, uh, was one of the, the really close to Jesus. He, he was kind of like a favorite. He's called the beloved disciple. John, who wrote this gospel, was also the one that wrote Revelation. He's the one that was risen up into the third heaven and had the, the visions of the end time. So he met Jesus and he walked with Jesus. He ate with Jesus and he lived with Jesus for three or four years and, 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 and knew him intimately, if you like, as a man. Uh, traveling together, sharing together, they, they, you know, they talked and they must have talked in depth as you do when you're together. And then he saw him in all his glory too, when he when he saw him as the risen Christ at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms. And, and John's whole point of his gospel, and that's relevant to why he's telling this story, he, is to say that Jesus, the man that walked the earth, truly was the Messiah truly was the son of God, truly was the one who, who brought on, who, who offers uh, a forgiveness of sins. You've only got to read chapter one of John's gospel. John's gospel starts off, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. And he goes on to say nothing that was created uh, was created but by him. And the word became flesh. That Jesus, this Jesus who he walked with, was there at the beginning of creation and he became flesh. Then he goes on to talk about John the Baptist and how when John the Baptist sees Jesus come, he says, here comes the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world. And all that is just in the first chapter of John. And when you get to the end of John's gospel, uh, in, the, in the penultimate chapter, John makes note of the fact that Jesus did so many miracles, there was too many to record, did many of them for the disciples, so the disciples may believe. And the three synoptic gospels, they, they detail many of those miracles. But John is the only one that records this wedding at Cana. And in fact, John, although he acknowledges Jesus did many, many miracles, he only records seven 
I told the seven, do you remember again, a few weeks ago, we were talking about the significance of the number seven. And here we are, here's another seven. John records seven miracles, but he doesn't record them just as miracles. And it says that right at the end of that reading, this was a sign. These seven miracles that, Jesus, that John records are signs of Jesus's messiahship. There is an, a, a mark of them that points to him as the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who brings uh, offering of the forgiveness of sins. And so for that reason alone, that John sees this as one of the most significant miracles, signs that Jesus did, makes this a significant story. And we put it into that context of understanding. John wants us to know the character and nature of God. John 3.16, of course, is probably the best known verse in the Bible, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And what is everlasting life? Well, John answers that as well in chapter 17, verse 3 says, eternal life is to know Jesus to know him here and now. John wants you to know the person, the character, the nature of Jesus. And so come to this story, the very first miracle that Jesus does, and know that it's trying to tell you something of his character and his nature. And it brings a new dimension to it straight away because it's kind of an odd miracle to do as a first miracle isn't it? In fact, Jesus specifically says, and we'll go into this a little bit later, he says, my hour is not come. He seems reluctant to do a miracle. In fact, the miracle he does is there for his disciples to see and the servants. The wedding guests know nothing of it. The bridegroom doesn't understand what's happened. The master of ceremonies doesn't understand what's happened. It was done that a select few might know about it. And church, those of you that are regulars at King's Arms, those of you that will visit us and uh, come when we were meeting prior to lockdown, you may remember that Barbara Seed actually brought a word to us based on this story. Um, she was prompted during the service and the spirit spoke to her and reminded her that, you know, what we do in secret makes a difference to a much wider audience and that she it related to this story, something she said, I've not seen this before. She said, only the servants knew and the disciples who witnessed it knew how this water had been turned to wine. The wedding guests didn't know, the bridegroom didn't know, the master of ceremonies didn't know. And it's like that, she said, God was saying that's like that with our prayers. We pray, as I did at the beginning of this service, for, for the other churches in Lydney, the other churches in this area. Uh, we as a church should be praying fervently for the town we live in, our neighbourhood and our friends. If you live in Blakeney or you're clear of the other towns, you should be praying for your neighbourhood too and for Ligny because you're part of this church here. And those prayers, few people will know that you are praying, but many should be affected. And you should have that expectation that God is going to do something miraculous through your prayers that are held in that secret place. So be fervent, be expectant in your prayer life that God is going something, even though people may not recognise how blessing is coming to them, even though they may not understand the cause of, of, of the blessing upon them or the healing upon them, that you are the instrument through which God is working, as indeed Jesus was the instrument through which God was working at that wedding. So that was one of the things that we brought out of this parable. There's so many more things that were, in fact, I've read it said, right to be, it says on the third day. And right at the beginning, it says it was the third day that this happened. And as you know, we call days Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and often they're named after gods, aren't they? Greek gods are days of the week. But the Jews very much, they're called the days one, two, three, four, five, and six, and Sabbath. And that was based on the creation story. And so, you know, this was the third day because many weddings in, in Canaan and in, in, in Israel would be held on the third day because the third day is the only day in creation where Jesus, uh, where, sorry, God specifically says uh, it was good twice. Everything he does, he says, he looked on it and saw it was good. But on the third day, that phrase is repeated twice. 
And so they see this double blessing on the third day and they relate that to the male and the female and the coming together of the union of marriage, that it's a double blessing on that third day. So just a little detail like that is, 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 is in the story. And there are other details in this story about, about the stone jars, the six stone jars. Again, many people would relate that to the fact that six days in creation and um, that there's a, a story in that, the work of man and the cleansing, because these were stone jars that were filled with water for cleansing. And those of you that have done a little bit of study in this will know that there was very specific rituals for the washing of hands before eating and, and cleansing of oneself uh, within the Jewish tradition, a very sort of legalistic process they would go through. And there's another story, isn't there, later on in scripture, where Jesus says you wash the inside, you sorry, you wash the outside, but you're, you're unclean on the inside. And so Jesus is taking these things where they wash the outside with water and he's filling them to the brim, another detail, with wine. And he is saying, I have come that you may be cleansed on the inside through the blood of Jesus, because wine represents blood. And he is filling those jars to the brim with his blessing, with the, the abundant uh, wine and, 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 and bringing us a, 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 an echo of the fact that his wine represents blood, as we're going to see in communion later, and that that blood brings cleansing to the inside and brings blessing in the age to come. So there's a, there's a story here. It's interesting that Jesus is at a wedding and when he comes again, he calls us the bride and he comes to bring the fullness and the union of that, that uh, uh, of, the, of the bride and him, the bridegroom. Is, he called, that is called a marriage when he comes and brings the age to an end and starts the new age. And here he is right at the outset of his ministry at a wedding, just putting in echoes of the fact that there will be his blood, his wine, and that the wine in the new kingdom and joy everlasting. There is a prophetic element to what Jesus is doing at this wedding. Because, you know, he could have chosen to do many other things, couldn't he? You know, you would have thought for your first miracle, you know, there, there was no one dead that needed raising from the dead. There was no one sick that we're told of that needed healing. There was no one there that was demonized and he could cast out a demon. But actually, Jesus, just by his will alone, transformed a situation that could have been not just embarrassing, but actually brought disgrace upon the family that were getting married. We don't know. <laughs> That's kind of another thing about this. There is a mystery because there are lots of things we, we don't know. We don't know who was getting married. People have speculated, actually, it was one of Jesus's younger brothers, uh, potentially. And they speculate that on the fact that Mary was so concerned about the fact that wine had run out. Uh, the fact that uh, she had some sort of authority over the servants. They were the waiters and the waitresses that she could say to them, you do what he tells you which is recorded in the story. So Mary had a, had a concern for the well-being of this wedding and, and she had some authority over this. So their speculation this could well have been a family wedding, but, but it is just speculation. Somebody has a wedding that was in scripture, but we don't know who they are. <laughs> and, and that's all we can tell. But um, there is Jesus at a wedding and he so often uses this analogy of the wedding of the bride and the groom. And he's using that right at the outset of his ministry. Like I say, this is the first recorded miracle of Jesus. And he chooses to do it in the heart of the people, in the heart of a wedding, at a, a, a time when he's saying, look, there will be another wedding. Because this also brings some sense to what this, this rather odd, it is odd, we can't get around it. It is an odd exchange between Jesus and Mary, where Mary comes to him, his mother, comes and says, uh, Jesus, the wine has run out. And he turns to her and says, woman, what is this to me? Well, what an odd way to address your mother for starters. And, and I don't, let, let's not get too concerned in the sense that when he said woman, it wasn't derogatory. He wasn't saying woman, like you stupid woman. Uh, in, in any way, there's no implication of that whatsoever. It, he addresses her as woman in the same way as he addresses any other woman when he meets like the woman at the well. 
and, and other women in his ministry. It, it is a, it's, it's a respectful term. It's, he's calling them ma'am or madam or, you know, uh, it, it is a respectful term. But a re even a respectful term to your mother isn't quite appropriate, is it? It, it, it's, it may not be rude, but also just addressing her as you would any other woman doesn't seem to have the right connotation to it. What is this to me? Because my hour has not come. And so Mary doesn't seem to be offended, though. We don't really know. Again, like I say, there's a mystery to this because we don't really know what Mary expected him to do. As far as we know, he's never done a miracle before. Nothing's recorded in scripture. So what was she expecting? But her reply is, you do, to, she turns to the servant and says, you do whatever he tells you to do. So she had some expectation of her son to do something. And she is in effect deferring authority to him. Not in effect, she actually is. And rather than being offended, as a mother could be, how dare you speak to me like that, young man? I'm still your mother, she could say. I brought you up. You know, your conception may have been rather unique, but actually your birth was natural. I've brought you up from childhood. You know, and she could have said, you know, I've brought you up. You've lived here. You know, in fact, there was a unique relationship, though, between, not unique, but a special relationship between Jesus and his mother. He was the eldest child because obviously she was a virgin when he was born. Um, sorry, when he was conceived, and, and so other children came later. So Jesus was the oldest in the family. We know that Joseph, his, his father, in inverted commas, was still alive when Jesus was 12 because he, the, he was presented in the temple. That's when they came and found him in the temple teaching. Um, but Joseph is dead by the time Jesus is 30. We're not recorded as to when he died, but Jesus been taught the trade of a carpenter, and so we would assume Jesus, uh, Joseph taught him that trade. So sometime in the last 10 years, Joseph had died and Jesus has inherited the role in the sense of being the lead male in the family. And so Mary must have depended on him in, in many ways. And there must have been a unique, uh, a special relationship between them. And so, you know, I sometimes wonder, you know, uh, Jesus is... What are the events leading up to this? Jesus being baptised, being out to, 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 to the River Jordan, being baptised and the dove has come upon him. And then he's gone off into the wilderness and he must have come home after those 40 days and 40 nights where he's been tempted by the devil and not eaten a thing. What his mother said to him when he came home, you haven't eaten a thing. You know, you look like you've been through a right battle. You haven't eaten a thing for days. But she knew all of these things. There was something special about Jesus and my opinion is this was a, a fulcrum moment in scripture because for, for all the things, you know, Mary is the only woman in that world that can truly say my son was perfect. Sorry other mothers, <laughs> but yeah, our children aren't perfect, but Jesus was. She could say that and, and I think she saw something in here, she knew because of this baptism, because of this time in the wilderness, because of the time in the temple where he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me. She knew as a mother that there, this was a, a turning point in their relationship, a turning point in, in his ministry. And that he was about to embark on his heavenly father's will and that her relationship with him was about to change. You do whatever he says, because she had had the visit by the angel. And she knew the promise that he was to be called Emmanuel, God with us, that he was to bring, take away the sins of the world. And Mary, having lived with this perfect child, has lived with Jesus and knowing that at some point now, here at the age of around 30, Jesus was about to embark on a new ministry. Jesus said, though, my hour has not yet come. Jesus uses this phrase eight times in John's Gospel, five times before his hour comes and three times when it says my moment has come. He's referring to his crucifixion. His hour of glorification is actually the death that he suffered on the cross for us. 
So here is Jesus at the outset of his ministry in front of his mother, being presented with this issue of no wine. And yet on his mind is still the fact that he knows he has a purpose, that God has an ordained plan for his life and that his life is not his own. That he has a walk to walk and he has a destiny, a date with the cross. And he says to his mother, what is this? Because really my purpose is the cross. And he's not ready to go public yet, totally in his ministry. But he does something so special with this water, with these cleansing jars, where he fills them to the brim and quits the choicest wine, the best wine. It sounds like that these, these uh, guests at the, at the wedding have ever tasted. And he does that, it says here, he did it as a sign so that his disciples who were with him at the wedding may believe. It was to, for them to see that he had the ability to change any and every situation. Jesus was a transformer of a potential disaster. I think I got sidetracked a bit earlier because at a wedding, you weren't just, it wasn't just a nicety to provide wine and food. In that culture, it was an obligation. In fact, it was a legal obligation. If you didn't feed your guests, they could actually sue you because they've traveled. There was a whole different dependency. You couldn't just pop down Tesco's and get more food. The whole culture was different. And when you had guests at your house, it was an obligation to feed them. And again, you know, if this was a relative of Mary's, then she would be concerned about that, that the whole family, she's already been embarrassed because she became with child whilst still unmarried. Does she want to become embarrassed again that she can't provide for her guests? But still, you know, Jesus transformed that situation, not from potential disaster for that wedding couple, to actually the choicest wine. And, and another prophetic element of this, Jesus in the prophetic of that wine being good wine, the best wine, he is telling us as Christians, and I believe this is one of the reasons why God put this on my heart to preach this now, because you may feel that you are in a potential situation of potential uh, disaster. You may be feeling that life is falling around you and you don't know what's happening and you don't know what the future holds. But God says, I am a transformer of situations. He did in that situation. I know I've probably quote this verse every week that he did immeasurably more than they could ask or imagine. And he changed the situation of potential disaster into actually a moment where people say, wow, what is this wine? You've saved it to last. And Jesus is telling us the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Jesus knew that he was going to pay a price on the cross, that he was going to die for our salvation. He was going to uh, bear our sins through pain and agony. But the best was the other side of the cross. And church, we need to really hold on to that in, in, in this time. In fact, in all of life, you know, we are not called primarily to hold on to this life. We are called to invest in our future life, in our eternal life. It doesn't matter what stage of life you're at, you know, this life, and I know this might sound harsh, but this life is temporary. Death is a certainty or transformation to heaven is a certainty, but the eternity with God it, it, it is, is also a certainty for those that believe in Jesus. And we can, we can suffer for the temporary that we may be blessed in eternity. And Jesus knew that, he had that on his mind, he had that eternal perspective even in that wedding, and he calls us to have the same mindset. So even in this situation, know that God is a transformer of situations. He, he, he will fill life to the brim. Do you know wine? Wine has both, when in, in terms of drunkenness, it's a curse, but in terms of, of discipline and taken well, it's a blessing, and, it, and it's a sign of abundance. Do you know we sang last week, we didn't read the song that... Uh, there's a place where the streets shine with the glory of the Lamb. And the last verse of that is there is joy everlasting. There is good gladness. There is peace. There is wine ever flowing. There's a wedding. There's a feast. We, have, we are all, as church, as members of Christ's church and the bride of Christ, an appointment and a destiny to be united with Christ. And that is our future, our destiny. So... That, that, that's a whole series of different things. There are more. There are more, but I'm just conscious of time going on. 
So what, what is the application? Well, there's so many different uh, things in there. I've already given you one, the application of knowing that Jesus is a transformer of situations. Trust him to transform your situation. Bring every need before him. And the second one is, could be taken from Mary, do not take offence, but recognise what Jesus is doing. As you stand humbly before Jesus, as Mary did, she stood humbly before our son, what was her instruction? Her instruction was to the servants, do exactly what he says. And it has, if you look at the words, it says, do exactly as he says and do it without delay. Do not hesitate. There's a command for us to let's do as Jesus says. Let's be obedient to his word, because those who love me will be obedient. Not those who are obedient, love me, but those who love me will be obedient, um, will bring blessing. And obedience brings results through through God's will. So we need to be humble and obedient, trusting and obeying. Uh, we may be like the disciples who saw this miracle and we need to see the signs and understand the signs of the time of what Jesus is doing. They were about to embark on an amazing journey with Jesus for the next three years or so up until his crucifixion. Their lives were about to be turned upside down and this was just the first sign that he was a transformer of situations. Can we see the signs around us of what Jesus is doing? Can we hold on to the promises that the best is yet to come? That there is a new age with wine ever flowing. Can we also have an eternal mindset and understand that this costs Jesus everything to bring us this hope and this certainty? That he blessed those people there and he wants to bring blessing to you, to those who are obedient to his call. He wants to bring blessing. I think there are people out there today that need blessing in their marriages. They need blessing in their personal lives. They need to sit humbly before God and allow him to work in their relationships and their lives. And I think that's something God may speak to you. If you take this passage, John chapter 2, the first 11 verses, go and read it again for yourselves. Because there's more in there than I've done today. And say, Lord, I need your internal cleansing. I need your love. I need to recognise it as your blood that was shed. As we're going to come before communion now where Jesus takes wine and says, this represents my blood shed for you. And you put wine in those casks, in those pots, those stone jars, as a sign of cleansing that is available to us. who will believe and obey and trust in him. So, Father, I want to say thank you for this word. I want to say thank you that you chose this as your first miracle. I want to say thank you that you've promised us a wedding. You've promised us joy. You've promised us peace. But you've called us also to be your bride, to be holy and acceptable before you. May we be obedient before you now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing Water You Turned Into Wine. And then we're going to come back and actually take communion in remembrance of this wedding and in remembrance of the, the price that Jesus paid on the cross. So let's sing, Our God, Water You Turned Into Wine.
There we go. Oh, there we are. Sorry, I was uh, I forgot to unmute there. And apologies, I have to keep adjusting the camera. But here we are, ready uh, before the bread and the wine. We've we've spoken extensively already this morning about the significance of the wine and the promise of the age to come, but also the cost that it was to 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 buy our salvation, to buy us freedom from sin, and to overcome death. Can I just read the second half of that, that Bible reading again, where the wine is taken to the head waiter uh, and he tasted this water which had become wine. He did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves good wine first, but when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of Jesus's signs that he did in Cana of Galilee. He manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Let's take a moment to reflect now that Jesus has saved the best wine till last. That there is a place where the streets shine with the glory of the Lamb, that there is a victory that he has won, that he has shed his blood, that we may enter into that glory with him, but that he has manifested his glory in this life now, and that eternal life is that we might know him now. Father, I just pray that people would know you now, that through this word this morning, people would recognise you as John's the, the writer of this gospel, his desire was that people would know you as the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who takes away the sins of the world. They would recognise you as, as, as God made flesh, 
as God now seated at the right hand of the Father, who, who is there to bless us, Father. Father, we stand before these elements, this bread and this wine, representing the body and blood of Jesus. And thank you that you made this move, that you moved towards us and came to us. Hallelujah. Just a moment's quiet for you to pray your own prayers. Ask God to forgive you for the things you've done that you shouldn't. Ask him to forgive you for the things you haven't done that you should. And just ask for his forgiveness for where there's things you're even just not aware of that were sinful and fell short. But he may forgive you and, and, and enlighten you as to how you may walk wholly with him. Father, we recognise that today we've talked about your first miracle, your first sign at a wedding. But you promised us a future wedding when you would come again and you would judge the quick and the dead. And we think of the moment that, that marked the culmination of your ministry on earth, when on the night that you were betrayed, you were at supper with the same disciples who were at that wedding and you broke bread and you said, this is my body broken for you, take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. So take your bread now at home, break it and eat it and remember that Christ's body was broken for you. And likewise, after supper, it says he took the cup with wine and says this wine is my, represents my blood shed for you, the promise of the new covenant, the promise of the life to come, the promise of sins forgiven, of salvation through my name. Take and drink and remember that I die for you and my blood is shed for you. Hallelujah. Just say thank you to the Father, thank you to the Son, thank you Holy Spirit that you are at hand, you strengthen us for today and bring bright hope for tomorrow, that you have fed us with your body and your blood, you have assured us of eternal life, may we live a life that is worthy of you, may we be a church that is worthy of our calling Lord, may we not just aim to have a comfortable existence here but rather to walk the walk that you call us to, Lord, and to bring blessing to our community and our town. And may all those that meet us know that we hold the peace that is beyond the understanding of the world. And it's through what you've done. It's been a pleasure to share the word of God with you this morning. It's been a pleasure to share this great story of the wedding at Cana. Such a celebration and Jesus bringing such a powerful moment to it. So can we go and live in, in the power and and authority of what Jesus has placed in us through what he did through his ministry through the signs and may we carry on those signs and wonders to the world around us that Jesus is alive today and willing to transform situations if any of those issues I've brought up about being humble before God obedient before God um, recognizing uh, that he holds the future that he needs to transform things if any of those are issues where you want more prayer then either join us at the prayer meeting on Tuesday, drop me an email or phone me, or get in touch with someone else you know in the church, but ask them to pray for you. Share it with a brother or sister in Christ and let Jesus come in and transform your life. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday, 9.30, uh, and worshipping and gathering around the word of God again. So we bless you and thank you.
Amen. Amen. Thank you.